for this is the will of God in Christ for you. So if you want to kind of give an outline for those three statements there in those three verses, rejoice always. Secondly, pray always. Thirdly, thank always. God wants us to be grateful under Him, day in and day out. Rejoice. If you want to really dissect the word rejoice and see what does it mean, there is a difference between the word happy, sometimes we can take it as joyful or rejoicing, but there is a huge difference between rejoice and being happy. We can be happy based on the circumstances. If everything is going good in our lives, our health is good, finances are good, our relationships at home are good, our workplace is good, and everything is going well, then we can be happy. So our happiness depends on the circumstances that are there around us. But rejoicing is to be happy, to be ecstatic, to be joyful, Hallelujah. in spite of the situations not being so good mm. in our lives. Hallelujah. And we read from Philippians. The very theme of Philippians is to rejoice, rejoice, and I say rejoice. Paul actually was writing that episode from the prison. But yet the theme of that book is rejoice. God wants us to rejoice day in and day out. Not just during Thanksgiving season, but even throughout the year and entire single day of our life. So rejoice always. Two, pray without ceasing. Pray always. Pray day in and day out. Pray not only when we feel like praying, but pray even when we don't feel like praying. Amen. Pray to Him. Pray unto Him day in and day out. Have that state of prayerful attitude always. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean when you're driving, close your eyes and pray. But you have an attitude of prayer. Amen. And in verse 18, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything, the word of God doesn't tell us, in certain things, give thanks to God. In some things, give thanks to God. No, the word of God clearly tells us, in everything, in every good thing, give thanks unto God. Even in every not so good thing, still give thanks unto the Lord. That is the kind of lifestyle God wants us to have. A heart of thanksgiving, an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude. Amen. Every single day, God wants us to have that kind of thankful, grateful lifestyle. Amen. With that background, let us move on to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. If you have your Bibles, please keep them open. And I'll be going through verse by verse and even word by word so that we get most out of the word of God and apply the biblical principles to our lives. Verse 28. And we know that in all things God works together for good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. In this verse, there are four thoughts. And starting with, we know. Paul was writing to the believers of Rome, to the Roman church. Paul was addressing and writing a letter to the Roman believers. And to them he writes, we know. Paul, including himself, not only myself as the apostle of Christ, but we as believers, we know. We know for certain. We know for sure. I am absolutely certain in the Lord. So one is 
certainty. We know that comes because of our close, intimate, experiential relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That kind of assurance, that kind of experience, that kind of confidence, that kind of certainty God wants us to have. It's a growing experience in our daily walk with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One is the certainty. Then we know that all things, not certain things, not only good things, but even not so good things, if you want to call even as bad things. We know for certain all kinds of things, the good experiences, not so good experiences, God works together. So the completeness, second aspect is all things. The completeness, all things that happen in our lives, God works them together. Hallelujah. God synergizes them. God works them for our good. For good of those who love God. Who is the cause? The causative factor is God himself. Amen. For what? For good of those who love, love God. him. What is the condition here? Loving God. It is God who loved us first, but in response we love him back, then all these things that happen in our lives, they work good for our blessing and benefit. Who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. God has called every one of us with a general purpose. And what is that purpose? You see that in verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be confirmed to the image of his son. What is the purpose of God toward our lives? God wants us to conform to his image, into his likeness, into his image. God wants us to be conformed. It won't happen overnight. The night you are saved or the day you are saved, that is not the time you are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. But we as we lead a godly life, as we stay in the word of God, as we apply the biblical principles to our lives, as we lead a life of prayer, developing a lifestyle of prayer, as we learn to depend on him, as we live by the biblical principles that are contained in the word of God, we will be conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. The moment we trust Jesus as personal Savior, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit starts dwelling within us. And God wants us to bring our entire being under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. As we bring ourselves under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and allow his leadership to dictate us to do the things according to his will and treasure and plan, then we will be conforming to the image of God. Always there is a battle between the flesh and the spirit. Flesh wants to do certain things. Our ego, our so-called fleshly personality wants our desires. But the spirit of God tells us that God wants his way in our lives. His purpose will be fulfilled in our lives. It won't happen overnight. It's a constant journey, everyday journey in our faith walk with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we look at even our family relationships, wife and husband, maybe in the beginning years of our marriage, things go well. Sometimes they may not go well, but over a period of time, everything will work out very well. Let me also add one humorous note here. For, uh, to kind of think about the practical aspects of our marital life. In the first year of marriage, or even before marriage, just getting to know each other, you are engaged and getting betrothed to be married, the would-be husband speaks and would-be wife listens. First year of marriage, wife speaks, husband listens. Third year of marriage, second year, third year, and so on and so forth. 
Both wife and husband speak, our neighbors will listen. <laughs> but over a period of time, what happens? We know the heart of our spouses. Mm. Wife knows the heart and mind of husband. Husband knows the heart and mind of wife. Amen. We start thinking alike. We start even saying the words that they're about to say. Mm. Amen. We know each other. We just become like look-alikes, think-alikes, do-alikes. That's what happens in our marital life. Why? Because there is a constant growing experiential relationship. That is exactly the same in our love story with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. As we know Him, not know about Him, but as we know Him personally, experientially, closely, Amen. intimately, that is when Alleluia. we know the heart of God. Yes. We pursue the heart of God. We want to be like Him. And therefore, over a period of time, we will be confirmed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what happens. That's what we see in verse 28. Alleluia. For we know for certain all things, completeness, God who works, is the causative factor and the condition is what? The condition is for those who love God. For those who love Him to understand His heart and pursue His heart and to become confirmed to His image. And then what is the consequence of it? Or what is the consummation of it? The consummation of it is will be conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the heart of God. That is the desire of God that we conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Even as we lead a life of believer, we are being sanctified. We are being set apart. Amen. We are being made holy. Amen. We are being made pure yes. on an ongoing daily basis. Amen. You are justified in a moment of time and we trust Jesus as personal Savior. But we are being sanctified Amen. throughout our daily life. That is progressive sanctification. We are being sanctified, set apart, made holy, made consecrated on an ongoing daily basis to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Now with that background, let us look into verse 31 through 39. There are three aspects to note here. One, verse 31 through 34, that is the Savior's surety. The surety or the assurance that our Lord and Savior has for each one of us. Verse 31. Who then shall say to those, to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? That is the assurance, that the surety the Savior has for the believer, for his children. That is, who can be against us if God is for us? So there is no intimidation for a believer. There is no fear for a believer because he leads a life of faith. We lead a life of faith. We become children of we learn to depend on Him day in and day out. In our secular life, we exercise a lot of faith. You board a flight and you sit comfortably in your seat. You don't even see the face of the pilot or the captain. But you are so sure that the flight will take off, go forward, and land safely. Are we not exercising faith? So, for a believer, there is no intimidation. He can be fearless, exercise faith for every aspect of our life. If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. 
Jesus did not, God did not spare his own son Jesus Christ for our sake to provide redemption. Therefore he sent him to the cross. Therefore nothing is deprived. He did not let his son himself. What did Jesus pray? If it is your will, remove this cup from me. Or was it removed? No. That is the very purpose Christ came with this world. Even God did not spare his son to provide redemption for us. That is the heart of God. Because he loves us so dearly. Therefore, there is no deprivation. We are not deprived of any good thing to come our way in the life of the believer. So there is no integration, there is no deprivation. And then, who shall bring a charge against God's select? It is God who justifies us. Justification is a legal term. We are justified. As if a judge would justify and give justice to the party concerned. Likewise, God set us right, made us right, and justified us, and made us righteous in his sight. So there is no accusation. We are already justified. Devil might try to accuse us. Even spirit might try to accuse us. Even people might try to accuse us. But there is no incrimination for a believer. There is no accusation for a believer. And then, verse 34. He who, who you see who condemns us. There is no condemnation for a believer. And there are four things that you can note in verse 34. It is Christ who died and further is also risen who is even at the right hand of God and who also makes intercession for us. A believer is never condemned because he is saved. He is eternally secure because we have our lasting life, life eternal. So we are not condemned. But for those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, the word of God tells, John 3, 16, 1 Peter 17, 18, so on and so forth. The one who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ is already condemned. But the person who trusts Jesus as personal savior is not condemned. We are protected. We are made secure. We are eternally secure in the sight of God. Because there are four reasons you can note in that verse 34. One, it is Christ who died because of Christ's crucifixion. In our place is a substitute that we are not condemned. Secondly, furthermore, is risen. Died, buried, but rose on the third day. And the tomb is empty. Because of this resurrection, you and I have the same confidence and assurance that we too will raise one of these days. <coughs> that is the greatest assurance for a believer about his own resurrection because his Savior is risen. And then the third aspect in that verse, who is even at the right hand of God. On the third day, he rose. And then he ascended into heaven. So he is exalted. He is exalted to be seated at the right hand of the Lord. That is the last part you see in that verse. Who also makes intercession for us. Seated at the right hand throne of God. He is interceding for us. Even as we sit here and worship him. God is interceding for us. He is pleading on our behalf. He is advocating on our behalf. Even when we do not know how to pray. The Holy Spirit is still praying on our behalf. God is interceding, Christ is interceding, advocating, pleading on our behalf. Therefore, we read in Hebrews, with confidence we can come to the throne of grace, knowing that he has his mercy and grace toward us. That can be our boldness. God knows our infirmities. God knows our depraved nature. God knows our weaknesses, because Christ in his human form, human person, he can sympathize 
we experienced is our lifestyle as a human being and in that is lying on the face of this earth in his great appear ministry. Therefore he can sympathize with us. He can identify with us. And it is a great confidence for us to know we have an intercessor in heaven interceding on our, on our behalf. So that is the Savior surety for us. Verse 31, there is no intimidation. Verse 32, there is no deprivation. Verse 33, there is no incrimination or accusation. Verse 34, there is no condemnation. And then let us look at the second aspect. The situations or the stormy situations that can come. God wants us to be thankful unto Him in everything. In good things it is easy for us to thank Him. But in not so good things it is tough. So even in stormy situations of our life, we can be thankful unto Him. Let us look at a few verses here that can come our way. Verses, verse 35, let us look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Tribulation, the trials and tribulations that we may have to encounter. A believer's life is not a better process. But even in the bed of roses, there are thorns. So we may have our quota of difficulties. But we are never alone because God is with us. Amen. The Spirit of God dwells with us. Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. God in us, with us, before us, behind us, beside us, above us, beneath us, all around us. Amen. We are never alone. He is Emmanuel. So therefore we can face any tribulation or any trial, any distress, any disappointment or distress that might come our way, or persecution, any oppression, or persecution that we see happening around the world, even in India. Any persecution, or any famine, any famine or any drought that can happen in different parts of the world, or we may have experienced some crimes, or even nakedness, poverty, or financial challenges, peril, or dangers, or even sword, wars, or terrorism that we may have experienced. So we can never be separated from the love of God in spite of these challenges that we may have to face in life. And also, Look at verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights or depths, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul, as he was detailing all these things that might happen, and verse 38 he says, For I am persuaded, for I am convinced, for I am assured, I am persuaded that neither death, neither the crisis of death or calamities of life, then angels or principalities, the intrusion, intervention of angels, or intrusion of demons or evil spirits cannot separate us from the love of God. Amen. Things present or things to come. The present cares of life, day to day life, or the future concerns of our life. Not height or depth. The ups or lows ups or downs that might happen in our life. The name and fame that we might enjoy at one time or not having that at some other point of time in life. 
or any other thing shall be able to, any other created thing. It is like a catch-all phrase. Anything can happen in our eyes, but nothing can really separate us Hallelujah. from the love of God. Yes. Nothing can separate us Amen. from the love of God. So therefore, we can stay strong because of the love of God. And in closing, let us also look at what is this love of God? As we know, the death love, the unconditional love, the universal love, the unlimited love, the unending love, the undestructible love, the irrefutable love. That is the kind of love that we have in Christ Jesus. It is eternal love, it is everlasting love. He has that love exclusively toward you and me. That is a kind of expensive love that God showed in Christ as he went to the cross. Because God loves us so dearly. Every single person, God loves us. And he universally loves that all who come with the same knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because of that love, we can have victory in our life. Now in conclusion, let us look at verse 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors Amen. to him who loved us. Whatever be the kind of challenge that you might face, mm. the good things that happen in our lives, even in not so good things that might come our way, we are more than conquerors. Do you see that phrase? We are not, it is not saying just, we are just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors. Of the English language, there are two words to say more than conquerors. Three words. More than conquerors. In Greek language, there is only one word called hypernikemia. You know Nike shoes? We wear Nike shoes to walk or to participate in sports. You know the meaning of Nike? Nike means victory. That's where they adopted, the company adopted that word Nike means victory. And the word of God, what does it tell? More than conquerors. Amen. We are super conquerors. Hallelujah. We are hyper conquerors. Amen. Because of the love of Christ. Amen. So that is the kind of lifestyle God wants us to lead. Lead a life of hyper victory. Amen. Lead a life of super victory. Amen. Super triumph. Hyper triumph. In our personal lives. Amen. In our family in our church life, in our ministries. What only the kind of aspect of our life God wants us to be a victorious, a super victorious, yes. super triumphant, super conquering life because of the love of Christ. The ending unconditional, unconquerable, undestructible love. In closing, as we close our eyes, look to God in prayer. As we have some soft background music, shall we reflect on these words? To lead a life of thanksgiving. Not only when things are going well in our life, even when things don't go well in life, but still be able to depend on Him. And to see some victories, super victories, super triumphs. As we listen to the music and reflect on the word of God. Lord, I want to see some super victory in my personal life. Lord, I want to see some hyper victory in my family life. Lord, I want to see some hyper victory in my ministry that you entrusted to me. Lord, whatever be the kind of challenge that we may face currently or in the future, I want to be more than a conqueror. Let me see 
hyper victory, super victory because of you. We have never lost because of your unconditional, unending, undestructible love, unlimited love. I am confident that we can see some victories as you reflected all these thoughts. If you would like to stand for the word of prayer, whatever is the scenario you might be dealing with, either personally or in the family or in the ministry or in the workplace, whatever is the situation, would you like to stand for a moment? These are the most sacred and precious moments of our entire service. Lord, I want to see some super victories in my life, hyper victories in my family, in the life of my children in the life of my grandchildren, in the life of my friends, in the life of the ministry, I want to see victory, super victory. We are more than a conqueror, not by myself, but because of you. Because of your love, unending love, unconditional love, exclusive love, in our love. Let's dedicate and rededicate our lives even during this Thanksgiving season. May I request that David and I will come and offer a prayer of dedication as we make these decisions before the Lord. Anybody's a good one. You're more than a good one. Anybody's a good one. 